Hi, everyone. Um, this is weird to have a microphone that doesn't actually need to amplify to all of you, but if I get quiet, will you please tell me? Just, like, not be shy and put your hand up? Okay. Um, so before I was here, like, literally before I was here, like, ten minutes ago, I was just over at the Metrograph, where one of my personal heroes, Samuel Delaney, who wrote this book, was there. Times Square Red, Times Square Blue. Um, and he signed it for me, and he signed it for me from the year 2020, so we are in the future already right now. Um, I, it's funny to hear the, the approach that I use described as academic, because I am a college dropout. I went to University of Massachusetts at Amherst the same time Samuel Delaney was there in the comparative literature department, and this book came out while I was an undergrad, and I probably would have dropped out if my advisor hadn't like handed me this book. Um, I had never read anything until I read Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, that was nonfiction theory and personal experience about sex and sexuality, but even more so, and if you've read the book, you know this, it's a story about what it is to, to live in a city and have, to be outside of your bubble. To, that sex in this book isn't just about, you know, the sex businesses of Times Square. It's sort of an organizing principle for living in a city. It's what it means to meet people that you otherwise never would have had contact with the kinds of relationships that people had with each other um, in these little encounters in the porn theaters and the peep shows. Um, you know, people, it seems like for Delaney, he, what he's saying is that that is what we are stigmatizing and that is what we are trying to outlaw when we try to uh, criminalize sex work but also criminalize same-sex sex and same-sex relationships. And that, I don't think this book would exist if I hadn't read this book like 15 years before. I started it. So I'm super honored I finally got to meet him before coming here today. And that's the part of the book that I'm going to read, which is also called Red Light Neighbors. <laughs> okay. A better and an offline equivalent to model our red light wanderings on might be the insider account of Samuel R. Delaney, whose participant observation in Times Square in its last pre-Disney gasps is as much of the porn theaters as it is about them and what they meant to those who cared for them. Times Square Red, Times Square Blue maps the various forms and sites of labor, theaters, food carts, camera shops, shoe shine stands, hustlers, and the kinds of people who frequent each, including himself, and his unguarded affection for the porn theaters and the anonymous sexual encounters they made possible. For Delaney, the value in a red light district like the ones once bounded by the streets around West 42nd Street and 8th Avenue isn't just sexual pleasure, though it's that too. The red light district signals the potential of contact, physical, mental, spiritual, that crosses class and race. I've worked in just one red light district in San Francisco's North Beach neighborhood, which is dotted still with strip clubs and porn shops and crowned by the legendary City Lights bookstore, which published and defended Allen Ginsberg's Howl on the southwestern edge, and by Cafe Trieste, which has opera on the jukebox and old men with nothing to do but read the paper all day up on the hill to the northeast. In the streets sloping in between, Broadway, Kearney, Stockton, tourists crammed together and drift between novelty Italian restaurants draped in garlic and roses and dumpling shops with whole chickens hanging in the windows. The purple neon marks the sex businesses, side by side with youth hostels, bars, corner stores, and cafes. We were all neighbors. Forget the particulars of the work performed inside the Hungry Eye, or the Lusty Lady, or the Garden of Eden, and appreciate the conditions of our shared neighborhood. You could take a public bus to and from a shift at work, step out on a break for a croissant at the Happy Donut, or a slice at Golden Boy, buy a magazine or a razor at the corner store on the way home. You had, all throughout your working day or working night, the opportunity for human contact outside your workplace itself. It wasn't necessary to drive out to the industrial zone on the edge of town. You had other plausible reasons to be in the neighborhood. You were both anonymous and safe in the way that you are in a city. You were, like everyone else who belonged to the neighborhood, another set of eyes on the street. When Craigslist's erotic services section launched, it wasn't the first website where sex workers could place ads seeking customers, but it was the first to so closely resemble the geography of the red light districts that preceded it. Remember that Times Square didn't contain only sexually oriented businesses. As Delaney captured it, the neighborhood was home to a variety 
low-end electronics and jewelry shops, single-room occupancy hotels, street-level workers informally selling sex, people selling kebabs and newspapers. As threatening as it might be that a site such as Craigslist provided a space for advertising sexual commerce, what's perhaps more threatening is that it did so alongside advertisements for any other kind of product or service imaginable. Rather than segregate sexual commerce, Craigslist made sex workers our neighbors. But consider this first. All sexual commerce is technological. Before electricity provided automation, the first peep shows operated under manual candlelight. Before telephones or even telegraphs, prostitutes carried printed business cards. In ancient Greece, certain classes of prostitutes attracted customers by scoring the words, follow me, on the soles of their sandals, leaving a trail in the streets behind them. Prostitution itself is a technology, a communication system, as much and at times more than it is a system for organizing sexuality. It signals. Walk for a moment through a red light district in your head and you won't see sex, just its red hot flares. Even the phrase red light district, as far as we know, comes from a communication practice, one said to originate with railroad men at the turn of the 20th century. They would set their red signal lights down outside the doors of the women they'd hire between shifts in case their foremen needed to call them back to work. And now when we hear tales about the red light district, they most likely won't be coming from people who buy or sell sexual services. The red light district you'll hear about today is the province of the surveillance class, the police and the politicians, the researchers and the reporters. From their mouths, the online red light district is rarely, rarely offered as a value neutral term to describe a kind of commercial activity on the internet. It's meant to convey what we're to understand as a troublesome growth and spread of commercial sex. The little evidence is offered for this alleged upsurge. It draws its evidence from a tautology that's appealing to those who can only know through surveillance. The internet makes sex for sale easier to see. So the internet must be increasing the number of people who buy and sell sex because now we can see them. The truth is we simply don't yet know how or even if the internet has expanded markets for commercial sex, but it has certainly allowed many more outsiders to peep into them. It's seductive to imagine that by being able to browse the storefronts of sexually oriented businesses without leaving our homes or without being seen, we have access to some truth about commercial sex. Why flip through the ads in the back of the paper, and there aren't that many anymore anyway, when you have the web. You can click through livejasmine.com where a mosaic of women's photos come to life and mouse over them on the homepage. <laughs> Dozens of streaming video feeds of all the performers available wherever it is they are and right here in the universal time zone of the live sex show. Both the site design and the vicissitudes of the real live new girl market mean that the mostly young women who've put out webcam shingles there seem to always be on and always available. Some of the women look right at you, or at their webcams, but just as many look off to the side. They're not avoiding you, they're just absorbed in their computer screen, in something else to pass the unpaid time between the viewers buying private shows. In the peep show, sex workers used the equivalent dead time to listen to the radio, and when customers made themselves known, they turned the boombox volume down with a toe while rearranging their bodies in an attentive pose. When the opportunity for voyeurism is your product, Tolerating anyone's eyes without a dollar amount attached just feels like you're getting ripped off. There's a certain amount of show a performer must give for free, but there is a line, and each worker knows it, between the attentions of a prospective customer and the neediness of a time waster. There's still people in my phone saved as time waster. Yes. <laughs> From like 15 years ago. <laughs> From like before the iPhone was invented. <laughs> This is from like a T9 era. Okay, sorry. End sidebar. Uh, these interlocutors into sex businesses, those would-be flaneurs with the mouse, particularly those who feel that they should not or must not pay, will likely be treated as the latter. What's the latter? Oh, time waster. Preserving one's propriety is no excuse. Having something to offer, money, is what makes you a good citizen of the red light district. We could say that peep shows and porn theaters and street-level sex work, particularly those conducted in mixed-use neighborhoods, are being displaced by online ad directories and live cam sites. But more to the point, the web sex markets are flourishing in the vacant spaces left in the wake of gentrification campaigns that imperiled the sex businesses that also called those blocks home. These physical spaces are gone and may never be again. 
The anonymous sexual encounter is now increasingly mediated by the digital. That mediation only magnifies the power of myth-making about the online red light district. It's no one fixed place, but a network of signs and solicitations. In the 18th century, we had the polite euphemism, public women, when it was necessary to reference those who were presumed to be prostitutes. But what public is left for the public women now? On the flickering front page of Live Jasmine, the rest of the public can imagine, as those equipped only with gaslight once imagined, the bodies upon which their illumination is cast. We're just waiting for them to drop in a coin and bring them to life. So it's all of this, not just the internet, that drives the online red light district, to the extent that there even is one. The reliance on surveillance to no sex workers, the adoption of online forms of solicitation, the gentrification of concrete red light districts through policing and capital. This all means that when we consider people who don't engage in commercial sex, who are most commonly known as the general public, they are far less likely to ever meet a sex worker in the physical world and are more likely than ever before to learn everything they know about sex work from marketing copy written for sex workers' customers. In the age of the online red light district, everyone has been made a John. Yes. Well done. And, I, and I should say, you've definitely met sex workers. You just may not have known that you were meeting sex workers. Um, I don't know, this is weird, because I wrote this, like, way before Sesta Foster. This is a five-year-old book. Yes. Um, I don't even know. Does Live Jasmine exist anymore? Um, no. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, certainly it doesn't have the name recognition it did in, like, 2013 when I was writing this. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it still exists, but it's, I yeah. think most people know about, like, My Free Cams or yep. Steam Mates and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but it's, it's still so relevant today. Um, yeah, I, I love so much of it. So, um, in her book, like she touches upon how um, gentrification has been done to uh, certain marginalized communities. So, um, especially in the city, you've seen a lot of gentrification. But also, you know, policing of sex worker has has led to a gentrification where they've been pushed from like their regular communities of like agencies or massage parlors and other places of work, you know, street walkers, um, into kind of more indoor online stuff so like they're publicly kind of invisible like they don't have as much contact but like now they're more visible than ever before and you know there's pros to cons to that because now more people can hear our voices but now everyone is like she said a john so to speak like you're perfu you are looking at sex workers through their marketing, through the fantasy that they sell in order to get hired, in order to make a couple tokens or, you know, dollars on the internet. So you're kind of, we are all like Johns. And there's also another chapter where you talk about how this kind of surveillance and police state um, creates a public that kind of becomes the police. Mm -hmm. They police, you know, you police yourself in terms of sexuality, you, you police your friends. Um, you police your community and you police sex workers. So there's, you know, a whole hierarchy of porophobia. I'm sorry, I've just... No, it's great. Baffling. It's great. Um, <laughs> did you want to read another quote or did you want to answer some questions? I don't know if anyone feels comfortable asking questions publicly. We are recording. Um, if not, there's a paper over there. You can write down your question um, so it can be anonymous. Um, also, I have questions here. So Do you want to start with an internet question and give people yes. a chance to... We shall do that. Okay. 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 Question numero uno. How has the visibility of sex workers on social media platforms like Twitter affected their portrayal in media and film? What what effects has this visibility had politically? I'm going to wait for folks to get a seat. It's okay. Yes. There's seats and seats and seats. Um, so the question, it, it actually is what I was thinking of coming out of this because I didn't even talk about social media explicitly, though certainly by the time I was writing this in 2013. So, like, sex work and social media, the explosion had, like, already happened. And I was totally wrong about sex workers and social media. Like, when I got on Twitter in 2007? The end of 2000? No, the end of 2006? I never thought that sex workers would use Twitter. Like, certainly not under our work personas. I just couldn't imagine like why 
clients would be hanging out on Twitter wanting to engage sex workers for free. It just seemed like these were like old fashioned dudes who like certainly like wouldn't even understand how to use social media and like why would sex workers want to hang out on the internet chit chatting for free? Like there were forums and things like that, but forums were different. Like they were much more like inward facing. It was sort of like going to like a meeting versus like broadcasting it to like a much broader audience who don't necessarily understand the like social cues. Um, and I was totally wrong, like a hundred, a hundred percent wrong. Um, and now, like, I think it's, it's gotten more complicated because people will have their persona for work, right? You may have your persona for work. And then you also may have just like your casual sex worker friends with other casual sex worker friends persona. And like, also maybe you have a third persona that's like under your, your legal name where you're doing something totally else in some other side business. And I, and I underestimated like how people could just switch between those different modes. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the, certainly it's changed journalists' accessibility to sex workers, like just the ability for, you know, there are, I can tell you, there are just reporters hanging out on sex work Twitter just like looking for what people are mad about Mm-hmm. and pitching stories about it and you will find them at Jezebel and you will find them at the Daily Beast and you will find them at Motherboard and like they're often quite good because the reporters are taking the extra step of building relationships with people outside of social media to actually learn more about what's going on in their lives um, it's not the sort of like stereotypical like I'm just going to embed some tweets in my story though there's certainly that kind of thing too mm-hmm. um, but now with FOSTA SESTA you know I don't I, I wish we had some kind of like baseline beforehand of sort of like what political discourse and exchange on social media was to see if people have been self-censoring. Like, I think that the thing that surprised me most about that moment is we saw this collapse of these two categories. Like people in their working personas who maybe never engaged in political organizing or speech online, like we're using their work personas to do that because those accounts may have had like way more followers than like their social just hang out with other sex workers account mm-hmm. or maybe it was to make a political point to like their clients to say like look like you have a stake in this too though I have like incredibly mixed feelings about client organizing and I think it's mostly a waste of time like I you know if it helped people raise some money for sex worker rights organizations then like more power to them um so I don't yeah I don't know so we're like a year out um from SESTA FOSTA and I think the, the explosion of sex worker pro- political speech online after, like, there might be more than there was before. Um, but I know that there are many people who've, like, just disappeared from the internet entirely, or I'm not seeing their tweets because they're not showing up in search, mm-hmm. um, that they're, they're getting shadow banned or, you know, they're not even, like, wanting to engage in that kind of dialogue online anymore. So it's hard to say. But I, this, it is this paradox of, like, you've never been more visible, and this crackdown is also coming with that. And... I don't know, I'm thinking of people like um, Tourmaline and Che Gossett and the work that they've done to talk about visibility and like what hap- like the trap of visibility. You know, when, when you, you and, a, and your community who have typically been seen as at the margins or as outsiders, if you gain a lot of visibility, that doesn't necessarily mean a good thing, right? That can expose you to so much more danger. It doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get power. Uh, yeah. And I think about that a lot. Yeah, I've seen it in my community, too, where some sex workers rely on kind of internet fame to try to maintain safety. Others just go off the grid, and others don't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. Um, So, like... Say more about, like, maintaining internet fame for safety, just, like, being really out there and thinking that will protect you. Yeah, I have, like, I don't want to out anybody, but, like, yeah, I have some sex worker friends that they kind of use any kind of fame that they can get as a form of protection because it's a criminalized market and they're, you know, involved in it, obviously, and that's how they make their livelihood, and they do very well for themselves, but, yeah, they do interviews with various, um, you know, they try to get their name out there as much as possible just in case something happens, then at least then, you know, it becomes a big issue, Mm -hmm. you know, then they will be in the media like, oh my god, I'm being persecuted for being a sex worker, and Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of might be a form of protection for people who are a little more privileged and have those connections and relationships, but for most people, it's like you don't really have a choice. I lost my Tumblr recently, that's that's been devastating, because I've had it for three years, I had 30,000 followers, and that was like my most close-knit community, like, those people understood me. They understood my sexuality, my nudity, my political art. They understood my political rants. They understood like the complexity of who I was as a person. Um, and I think the closest I've gotten is Twitter. But even then, like Twitter engagement is not the same as Tumblr engagement. So that losing that was 
horrible, but also seeing the devastation it caused among the LGBT community on Tumblr was sad because some of these people weren't even like sex workers. They just they did um, cartoons that were sexual in nature, might have had political stuff in it as well, or just educational stuff about what it was like to be in the LGBT community. And now that's getting censored on YouTube and, and Tumblr very heavily. So um, it's been devastating to see that because that was like how they learned about their identity and sexuality and were able to explore. So losing the community has been really sad. Yeah, Tumblr is such like an intimate space. It's yeah. just and now like the absurdity that like Pornhub is like fake saying they want to buy it. It's just like adding yeah. insult to injury. I've had experiences with that. Oh, well, I guess so. Uh, for the yeah. normies who don't know, uh, Pornhub is a piracy site. Um, it was created by a tech bro and then bought out by another tech bro. His name was uh, Fabian. Hmm. It was Fabian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Fabian Fabian. Fabian Tillman. Yes, Tillman. Okay. And then he he bought it and he was able to get a bank loan because he's in tech. Uh, He started a tech company and it became huge. And it was all about stealing pornographic content and letting any user upload this illegal content for free. And because it's the sex industry, like people don't really even know that it's piracy. Like they just think, oh no, this is how you get porn. Like it's always free. You know, there's no cost to this. Um, And then after he became so big, he started buying up legitimate porn companies. Uh, So I think he. This is Mind Geek, the beginning of that. Yeah, Mind Geek. Um, His company is called Mind Geek. That's the tech company. Um, But he owns Pornhub, he owns various actual porn companies, and then he also owns other piracy sites. So it's like a weird loop of legitimate business getting stolen and uploading, and he just owns all of it. It's a monopoly, basically. Um, And any laws that are against sex work impact sex workers and directors and producers. Um, They don't impact him because he's in the tech industry. So when SESTA-FOSTA got passed, um, I saw on Twitter Pornhub was like, didn't care like he's like oh we'll take in the refugees you know so heard about sister fasta you guys can upload your content on our an opportunity for him yeah yeah so he's trying to make like a youtube thing except not nearly as profitable as when youtube started at all so you can upload your content there for free and get like a couple dollars out of the hundreds of thousands they make off of you for the rest of your life um that's like You know, for him, it's like exciting, right? And uh, they're doing something in the UK now where they're banning porn. Uh, They're not really banning porn, but basically they are putting MindGeek, which is the company he owns, responsible for verifying people's age. So you have to actually upload your ID to MindGeek in order to watch pornographic content. And this is the company that has destroyed the industry and has, you know, profited from stolen content, contact. Now they're like, going to be the ones responsible for IDing people and having all this personal data. So it's, it's really scary what's happening, but unfortunately, like governments, they, they respect tech companies that do stuff like that. They don't respect the workers or the yeah. industries. And especially because they have a lot of lobbying power. Like, I just want to preface that I'm over here because I don't really want to be videotaped. So also for the people in the front, just the back of your heads will be on video, if that's okay. Um, and I have a mic for questions, or we can write stuff down. But I have okay a um, lead-in so question yeah, of course, of course. for Melissa. I think that's on the list. Yes. But I will record it with my lavalier. Um, I think this is... We kind of touched on it already. Um, so how does the change in landscape of where sex workers advertise from the red light districts, from like essentially public space, you know, that's, and you talked about, I think the history of Mm -hmm. of red light districts, um, to online ads where they can be accessible by pretty much anyone via the the public, but the public doesn't actually have to interact with them. Mm -hmm. So they can be, there's like this voyeurism. How does that, um, can you talk about more of how that affects the way that the public perceives them? And how specifically has SESTA BASTA um, shifted public awareness Mm -hmm. of sex workers' lives? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing to think about, too, with red light districts, like, I kind of talked about where the language came from, but the logic of a red light district is segregation. And 
the red the term red light district doesn't even appear in print in English until like the 1880s. So this is like a very new concept. This is a concept that's coming out of you know, rapid technological growth coming out of rapid growth of cities. Like it comes out of a lot of anxiety of like what women are doing to make money. Um, and the idea that like this particular way of making money needs to be segregated from everything else. Um, and when you, when you like read about like segregation at that time in like the 1880s and 1890s, like sometimes it means red light district, sometimes it means racial segregation, sometimes it means both. Um, because the red light district itself was a very racialized way of organizing space in a city. Um, and a lot of the, the the logics that like animated Sesta Foster, this idea that like scary men are coming to kidnap your daughter and sell her on the internet like a pizza, it comes out of that same era of the origins of the red light district, the origins of the white slave panic, as we call it now, the idea that there are scary people, and at that point in time, the scary other who is stealing your child, sometimes were Chinese immigrants, sometimes were Jewish men, sometimes were men of color, and they would like hold her captive in a physical space in the red light district. Um, and so now like the internet is sort of like, it doesn't quite map, right? Like it doesn't like, I, I, I like find it hard to even like think of the internet as like a space. And you would have these politicians arguing for Sesta Fosta saying like, the back page is the biggest online brothel or it's the Walmart of sex trafficking. And they're like trying to like figure out how to <laughs> describe what is essentially speech, right? But they're trying to like make speech a place and, and the internet is, is tricky that way. And I still haven't, like, worked this out. Um, I don't know, like, the right way to think about it. But certainly, like, a newspaper is speech, right? Like, the Village Voice was speech. But it was speech that in New York City had, like, a physical presence. And it was around you. And you could pretty much grab one wherever until summer of 2017 <laughs> when it stopped printing. Um, and there's nothing really that, like, that fills that same function in physical space. Maybe phone books still have escort ads. Maybe. Like, the very first escort ad I ever saw was in the Yellow Pages. Uh, and I talk about it in the book. I had, like, really weird clip art of, like, a lipstick or a high heel or, like, a <laughs> lipstick, like, mouth. Um, and it's, like, very rudimentary. So, like, compared to that, to have, like, a full-color website where you could put up as many pictures as you want, like, there was a time where that seemed like this most exciting thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so strange to me to think that that's the content that's easier to censor right now. Not because you can actually control the internet, but because you can control the people who control the internet, you can make them scared to host that content. So there's a, a content distribution network called Cloudflare, and they got a lot of press in the last year because they were the hosts of a website called Daily Stormer, a white supremacist website. And they were also, for a time, the hosts of Twitter, which was the Mastodon instance that was sort of, Mastodon's like a open source kind of version of Twitter. And, and Twitter started, and the lead up to Sesta Fosta, this fear that sex workers were going to get, you know, kicked off of Twitter en masse and to give people an alternative to build their network, to build their followers. And Cloudflare kicked Twitter off in like two days. But they like debated for months about whether or not to get rid of the Daily Stormer. And they're, they're, you often see them like there'll be another kind of like Cloudflare is hosting another white supremacist group. It's like they apparently don't have like codified policy on the content when it comes to Nazis. Um, but when it comes to sex workers, like they'll kick them off. Um, I'm really scared, actually, that a lot of the, the, the current debates about, like, what do we do about Nazis on the internet are, like, happening in total isolation from what just happened to sex workers on the internet. Yeah. Um, and I don't... I Like, I'm personally very concerned that, like, on the one hand, I want to deny platforms to Nazis and white supremacists. On the other hand, I don't want to, like, chip away at federal speech protections in order to do that. And so then, like, what does that leave you? The, muscling the platforms themselves. And we've seen the platforms are, like, totally willing to cave when it comes to sex work. You know, none of these people have been sued. There's been no litigation connected to sesta Fosta. Like, nobody has been, you know, dragged into court to account for why they allow sex workers to be on their website. I think Facebook is subject to some litigation around sex trafficking right now, um, as well as hotels. Like, this, this lawsuit is basically saying that, like, Facebook is as guilty as a hotel for letting sex trafficking happen, even though you actually can't commit sex trafficking on a website, right? But there's this idea that they're a space like a hotel, and so they should, but that's not even a sesta Fosta thing. So all of that is to say, like, this is still, like, really undetermined. Like, you see this great willingness to crack down on one community and a huge amount of reluctance to crack down on actual violence, and I don't know where that's going to go.
but it feels like really live right now and like desperately in need of some leadership that that understands that you know sex workers aren't just a piece of content but actual human beings this is an economic issue this is an issue of like the ability to exist as a public person even if that's under a pseudonym right like you still have to be public in order to work um, so it's also not just purely a speech issue. It's a speech issue and it's a labor issue at the same time. Yeah, I like the part in your book where you went over how this crime is like a, a crime of communication mm -hmm. and building community. Um, because she, she talks about how, you know, one of the ways in which sex workers are mainly known at, from is, is from, the, um, from that scene that we all know so well, right? Um, a girl meets her client, they agree to certain terms and a service and a price um, and the money is exchanged or they agree verbally and then she is handcuffed and like humiliated for the whole world to see like that single moment. And you know, it's obviously weird if you are a sex worker or you know what our job is because that is like the least amount of time we ever spend doing that. You know, most of our time is spent doing other things. Part of the reason why people go into sex work is that it buys you time compared to any other industry, basically. So we get reduced to that moment. And she went over it very brilliantly that in, a, in and of itself, like replaying that moment, it is a form of punishment because it's you become um, you are basically turned from a person to, you know, a woman to a prostitute. And that like is a reputation that like you know, destroys your entire life. And it's something that's recorded forever. And that in itself is the punishment. And it's a violent thing to do. And so many people who claim to care about us, they kind of ignore that that in, in of itself, the surveillance and the policing is, is violence. Like the most violent thing we can do as a state. So I really love that. Um, I'm going to ask you another yeah. question. Um, how has the prostitute imaginary shifted since you first started working, uh, writing about sex worker, if it has shifted at all? Yeah, so the, the prostitute imaginary, now I'm gonna have to remind myself what it is because I wrote this a long time ago and I don't reread it all that often. Um, I think what I meant by that was sort of the, the sex worker that exists in people's minds collectively, right? So not just like your own individual conception of who a sex worker is, but the shared sort of cultural mythos. Um, I do think it's gotten more diverse in some particular ways. Like, I am completely shocked, and I'm staring at you, that there's this Netflix series now yes, <laughs> about a grad student, pro dom, who has, like, no boundaries, oh, and, no. you know, like, that, 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 that thing that, like, that character that I'm most familiar with from anti-sex work activists being like, well, you're all grad students or something, you know, you're all 1% privileged, blah, 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 you don't deserve rights because you love your job and whatever, we don't have to listen to you because you're in grad school. Um, it, it's this, that that's like a character now is really interesting. And I also think it's like serving this function of like, you know, it's, sort of wanting to acknowledge that sex workers have lives outside of sex work, but it's still like this incredibly caricatured, oversimplified, apolitical, lonely, right? I haven't seen the show, but every review I've read of it just emphasizes like this person has no sex work community to speak of. Um, and so I haven't seen like reputa representations of collective sex worker anything, you know? Like, I mean, one of my favorite movies that does this is the movie Working Girls which is from like the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Lizzie Borden, yes. And it's got like the best scenes I've ever seen in a movie of just like the boredom of sex work and like killing time in an in-call um, and all the random shit that you get up to when you have nothing else to do. But like, it's hard for me to say like my favorite depictions of sex work in our imaginations would be boring, but kind of. Like I'm aspiring for the non-controversial. Like I'm aspiring for those things to like just be, um, Accepted. There, there was a review that um, Pasta Chips, uh, otherwise known as Molly Smith, the co-author of Revolting Prostitutes, she posted this review of a, a, a documentary about sex workers that's screening now in Scotland. And the review is sort of like, it's so, they're so delicately dancing around that they're sex workers. It's like they never talk about it. It's like, yeah, because they're like hanging out together and doing email and baking cookies and talking about each other's kids. And it's like apparently those things don't count. Um, so that, that tension, I think, we're still 
Like even when you make depictions of sex work that are like broader, people are like, "But where did the sex work go?" And it's like, "What do you what do you have to see for it yeah. to be like real?" It's you know? weird that like um, I don't know why it's like the most complicated thing in the world. Like you combine sex and then like exchanging money, and people are like, "I don't know how this works. We need to get down to the truth of this industry. I need to know." <laughs> right. So like it's you too know, you complicated. See it, you see yeah. it played out in the media, and they're like, "We need to get to the bottom of the reality of how this works." So they need to see it over and over again, and they still don't think they like they got to the truth. Like I don't know how much more terrible they want it to be. Like it's not it's terrible. terrible. Yeah, it's yeah. so weird. Yeah, yeah. obviously sex workers call it trauma porn. Um, yeah, people in third world countries call it poverty porn, yeah, yeah, yeah. where it's like you, you need this stuff played over and over again. And the premise is, is the same. It's kind of like these people are below us. They're going through like these horrible conditions. But um, I don't really see people really wanting to like elevate us or change those conditions in any way, like at all. So it's kind of just like, I don't know, it's weird, this kind of documentation and journalism and, like, expert thing where it's, like, you, you show how horrific people's lives are, and then, like, watching it and being aware is supposed to be, like, um, like, you're a good person, because, like, you're, you're watching this and you're like, oh, wow, these people are, wow, their lives are so horrible, like, they're suffering so badly, and that's, like, supposed to make you feel good, like, because you're aware that people are suffering somewhere far away and right. you, you don't get to hear from them you just get to see their torment played in front of you and it's like I have to watch this to be aware but it has like, like a issue. it has like a social disciplinary function right it's like we're just going to keep hammering you with these images of this is all that a sex worker can be this is like who they are and also this is who it's safe for you to dump on and just sort of displace all of your anxieties about sex or capitalism or exploitation or violence or gender-based violence on this person. Yes. And I don't think, like, producers at, like, MSNBC are sitting around, like, how can we better discipline the social... Fa-? You know, like, they're not, they're not like, like laying their Foucault on the table. They're, they're just sort of, like, doing the same shit over and over. Like, I would love a supercut of that, like, Sex Slaves of MSNBC series, which it always used to be on, like, Sunday nights for some reason. Um, and there are like people who like say they became anti-trafficking activists after seeing this show, and there, there's nothing like that. There's nothing like that that sex workers have um, that has like that equal power. But I also wonder if we're getting to a point where people are just numbed to that, yeah, um, and that things sort of have to change. But it, it just seems like we're still stuck in this idea of like anything but that is exceptional. Anything but that is like some like really special person. Um, that that clearly managed to transcend her circumstances, right? And I, I got that treatment myself when I was touring this book, particularly in Germany for some reason. Um, I was asked questions like, how is your soul? Like, literally, like, what is the state of your immortal soul? Um, <laughs> having had done sex work. Um, and then also being told I don't look like a sex worker. Um, and it's just like, how do you even respond to people who say these things to you? But they were said to me, like, straight face, like, this is a totally normal question. Um, so the people making the media, you know, and I'm one of them myself, like, are, like, also baking in these stereotypes and, you know, whether they're unconsciously reproducing them because it's, like, easier and they don't have other people to talk to who answer the phone as quickly as, you know, the anti-trafficking people do. I think that's, that's a huge part of it, too. Like, there's the way that media gets made is all about access. And if the people who always answer your calls and are always available for you, who are paid to always be available for you, that's the story that gets told. Yes. Until yeah. Twitter. Yeah, that's true Which, as well. Yeah, is, uh, yeah I, I guess the, the idea that like you can be a voice for the voiceless is, is a very popular thing, that there's people out there who are so oppressed, they can't speak for themselves, right? So like, there is no one from Honduras, there's no immigrants or like, kids who might have survived and been child migrants in the U.S. that can speak for themselves. So we need to all be horrified and speak up for these kids because it's not like anyone else had already been through this. Or like same thing with sex workers, right? Like there's no one. It, we have to speak for these um, faraway people that are being tortured and we can't even imagine. And that's impossible. You know, people have to speak up for themselves and you have to give the mic over. Um, wanted to ask you another yes. question. Uh, can you talk more on your reporting of the experiences of sex workers in Cambodia and how that contrasts with depictions of them in the U.S. media by many anti-trafficking campaigns? Sure. Cambodia's 
so the the time that I spent in Cambodia was actually not as a journalist, but I ended up producing journalism out of it. Um, I was actually there as like a human rights consultant, and uh, this was in 2007. And at the time, U.S. anti-trafficking law um, was being replicated in Cambodia. Um, the kind of U.S. anti-trafficking international mechanisms that come out of our State Department that include like grading every country on how well they're doing at fighting trafficking. Um, that pressure led Cambodia to just tremendous crackdowns between like 2006 and 2008 on sex workers, on homeless people, on drug users, on kids living on the street. Uh, people were literally ending up in former prisons that the Khmer Rouge had used to torture people. And Human Rights Watch and also Likaido, which is a Cambodian human rights organization, and it did intervene. And as far as I know, like that kind of extreme detention and crackdown ended around 2010, which isn't to say that sex workers in Cambodia aren't facing that kind of repression. But there was a particular wave of it that was very much influenced by the United States and using foreign aid as leverage to push Cambodian law enforcement into this, this kind of crackdown. So that was what was interesting to me about Cambodia. Um, at the same time, we have journalists um, like Nicholas Kristof, who you know at the time had been writing for, about Cambodia and sex workers in Cambodia for a couple of years, and was producing stories that were like, I literally went and bought this woman from a brothel, um, and now we're gonna see how she's doing. Oh, she went back to the brothel, huh? Anyway, moving on. Like, no, no sort of like, why might that be? Um, or elevating um, individual activists, um, like a woman named Somali Mam, who was not herself a sex worker, but who said she ran shelters to rescue children from sex trafficking, um, who then later was found out to have been fabricating stories and also tacitly supporting those crackdowns. So. My, my experience in Cambodia was very limited. Like, I was only there for two weeks. Uh, I was mostly there with international sex worker rights activists. So folks from Cambodia who were living through these raids, but also people in India who'd been living through these raids, people in Brazil who were organizing, um, people in France who were organizing, people, like, it, it was like a, a learning environment where sex workers from other countries were sort of helping Cambodian sex workers figure out how to document these police raids. Um, using their camera phones, how to get that footage out, and and use the actual act of photography to like intimidate police out of their actions. So that was my experience, and that is not the experience I saw reflected in Western media or much media at all. Um, and and that's that was a huge turning point for me, like in my work, like that this was what mattered was what the police were doing, and and I also felt this huge responsibility as an American to to own up to the fact that this was our foreign policy goals that created this environment. And I don't think most people at that time knew that that was what we were doing with our anti-trafficking laws. And I don't even know if most people now that that's what we're doing with our anti-trafficking laws. Yeah, I, that's been my experience too. Um, in Honduras, uh, the only way to get foreign aid is if you meet very specific requirements and they have goals for you. So like privatize your land and water, um, that's a requirement. So like companies and um, the World Bank and um, the Monetary Fund, like all work together and they decide how they're gonna privatize certain countries and what they're gonna do with the land and the water and the people there. And they make deals and that's how the people in that country are able to get foreign aid and that money has to go to very specific places. So one of the places that it went to in Honduras was to maintain a government that was largely controlled by the U.S. So the money went toward like police forcing, equipment, guns. Um, the U.S. actually trained various militia in Honduras to crack down on the people, unions, you know, crime. So very specific laws have to be in place, anti-prostitution, anti-trafficking laws. You have to fight the war on drugs with them, otherwise you're not getting any help from them. And that's where a lot of the money goes to. Mm -hmm. um, Anyone have any public questions? Yeah, do we have any questions? Let's see him. Yeah. All right. Or a list? <laughs> I'm gonna pass this down. This is a hard question. I mean, 
I can't answer it without sort of asking a couple of questions about it, so I'm going to be that person. Um, I don't know that it's as healthy as going to a yoga class or going to a therapist to seek sexual services. Like, I don't know. That's a live question, you know? I think for some people it might be. I think for other people it isn't. Like, you know, my, my understanding of the stigma that might be animating that um, is much more rooted in the experience of the people who are selling sex. It's much more about them. And then it's sort of like stigma by association with them. And that's what I'm more focused on. Um, I think that we don't actually alleviate the stigma of the people who are selling sex by focusing on the stigma of people who are purchasing sex or sexual services. Um, that in fact we could undo that stigma if we did undid the stigma that sex workers face. Um, but I also think it's, you know, I'm going to shout out Revolting Prostitutes again. Like, it's their analysis, uh, Juno Mack and Molly Smith, is an analysis of sort of, like, getting out of that stigma that doesn't require saying that sex work is good. And, and, and saying that, like, this stigma is dangerous, this stigma isolates people, this stigma says these people are less than, and that's enough. Like, that's enough to want to undo that. We don't then also have to, like premise on doing that on because sex work is good or okay or fun um it, it gets you out of that bind and then I think it also speaks to like a much broader range of experiences of people who sell sex who don't really care if their customers are having a good time um or who might really care or who are indifferent right now like it's there, there's no sort of like template customer and there's no template worker yes. um could add to that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, the experiences are really varied. Like, for instance, if you're trying to find a therapist, you know, there are some therapists that could do more harm to you by having you as a client. Because, for instance, I've been going to therapy for like over 10 years. And the one therapist that I saw the longest did more harm than, than like she'll ever know because I wasn't ready to get treatment. Um, but I was just kind of going out of obligation. Um, just because I thought maybe it would make me feel better. We were not compatible at all. She was very shameful toward me on um, various different things, like from my views to my sexuality. I wasn't even having sex, but like just like me wanting to talk about certain desires was not good for her. Same thing with yoga classes, right? So some yoga classes that I've been to, um, there was a woman that had seizures like she started having hot flash, hot flashes, not seizures, mm -hmm. hot flashes. And the yoga teacher was like, well, maybe that was good for you to get out. You know, that, that could be bad energy. <laughs> you have yoga classes like that that are really bad. They're toxic environments. A lot of them are anti-vaxxers. That isn't to like say anything bad about them. Like I love yoga and I love the people, but like, you know, it's kind of the way you should view sex work. It can be good and it can be bad and it varies on who you're talking to. Some sex workers just do it for survival. Uh, some sex workers really believe in the work that they're doing and they try to transform their clients' lives and, um, you know, getting, for instance, I have a friend that works with men and she gets them out of, um, you know, cisnormative sex. So she has helped a, a trans woman come out of her shell or, um, you know, different stuff like that. So it really varies on the person that you're talking to. It is extremely varied. A lot of sex workers don't care. Like, it's just a, an activity for them. Kind of like if you're ordering someone a latte, so you have to go through the motion, the li physical labor of running around and making the latte, so that, to them, is, like, that's what they do, basically. So it, it's really varied, and I think that's the way you should approach it. More questions in the room? Yeah, thanks, y'all. Um, we're in this like beautiful bookstore, and so I wanted to ask a question um, that was more about the legacy of sex workers and folks in sex worker adjacent communities writing their own stories um, for themselves, for us, and centering voices that are so often, um, you know, so often there were these trends in, in books about sex work that were so so academized, where they were they were just like social research based, um, you know, texts. And I'm not saying that those things aren't valuable. I think that they can be, mostly for us to critique them, right? And mostly for folks in community to like intervene using them. But like you keep bringing up revolting prostitutes. We're here discussing your beautiful book, 
there's a legacy, albeit like a smaller one, of these kinds of works. And I was wondering if it might be um, fruitful if we you know, plug some of those, uh, being that this is a book club, and, and maybe have time to talk about Prostitutes Our Life, or to talk about some other memoir-based works um, and other political works, like Selma James. We usually have the collection here, um, Women, Race, and Class, um, that has that beautiful essay from Selma James in it. So, I don't know, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to just riff on some of the, the like beautiful tradition of For Us, By Us right. literature. I mean, the very first book I think I ever read about sex work, which was very much the, like, coming out book, I actually like, read it on downtime at work, was uh, Carol Queen's Real Live New Girl, which is, like, kind of in the problematic fave category now in some ways. <laughs> um, just because, I mean, her take on sex work in that book is very much, like, this is great and wonderful, and, like, only people who think it's great and wonderful should do it, which is, like, a very hard place to organize from, um, among other things, and just wrong. Um, but the, the kind of books that I came up with, certainly before I found things like Samuel Delaney's book, were that very much in that vein of, you know, I am a sex worker, I'm going to tell you what's what, and I love that. But like, what followed what's what was usually like graphic stories about clients, how much fun it was, how little work it was. Um, you know, like de-emphasizing money, <laughs> like, um, you know, it, it's, there are tropes associated with that that I'm like happy to leave in the dust of the 1990s. Um, and then the other kind of strain were like academic books, like, and, and also books that were published by academic presses, but they weren't necessarily academic books. I'm thinking of Whores and Other Feminists, edited by Jill Nagel, who, as far as I know, never published or edited another book about sex work ever again. It came out in 1998. Um, it's still out there. It's still in print. And, you know, it's because it's an anthology, I think it gets around that that very 90s sex positive sex work trope. Um, and there are also some really excellent critical reviews of it at the time that it came out um, from more left-leaning kind of anti-sex sex workers. Uh, and I wrote a piece about it for um, Pacific Standard, rounding up some of those reactions. So that was like the, the, the like sex worker literary tradition that I had available to me. And just to underscore too how thin it was, like one of the things that I'm still carrying around in my library is one issue of a magazine that is long defunct called Anything That Moves. It was a national glossy bisexual magazine that existed for like 10 issues maybe in the 1990s. And like one of them showed up at like the feminist sex toy store in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, which is down the street from where I went to school. And it had Carol Lee, the Scarlet Harlot on the cover with like her American flag regalia. Like she used to wear this kind of like Miss America drag that was like literally the flag turned into like a Scarlett O'Hara type huge gown with like red feathers and a sign that said be nice prostitutes. And she's talking to a police officer in this outfit on the cover of the magazine. So of course I picked it up. Um, and you know, that was my exposure to Coyote, um, the sex worker rights group in San Francisco that was also sort of defunct by that time. And the Exotic Dancers Alliance. Um, and, and getting this sense from it that like San Francisco must be the center of sex work. <laughs> However, San Francisco is not really the center of literary production. <laughs> and, and, um, and I think that it took a while. You know, Seal Press has certainly been very faithful of publishing uh, both anthologies and memoirs about sex work. One that is sort of forgotten is um, Sex and Bacon by, oh my God, I'm gonna forget her name now. She was on Live Journal. Um, it was like one of the very first, like, I don't know what the fuck I think about sex work, sex work books that I ever read. It came out in the mid 2000s. Um, Revolting Prostitutes I've shouted out yeah. so many times. I mean, that's all, that comes from my same publisher, from Verso. And I think the strength of that book, among other things, is that it's written by two people who are still doing sex work. And that feels like the last sort of barrier to have books by sex workers who are still doing sex work. And there's so many reasons that that doesn't happen, right? Like your publisher generally wants you to go out on a tour and show your face. Maybe that's not something you can do. Um, typically speaking, if you're a sex worker who is a current sex worker who write about sex work, you're probably in a much better economic position than other people. Um, and maybe, I gotta tell you, books do not make as nearly as much money as sex work. So like, you know, you're making a choice to yes. do that. and. And that, yeah, that's like the, the gap I still see in being able to get. And certainly zines fill that gap, and you know, stuff that people are publishing online and anthologies fill that gap. And now I have like many more like self published works in that vein, um, like Prostitute Laundry, uh, Charlotte Shane's book, which is back there. 
um, from her Tiger Bee press. So, yeah, I mean, we need more, you know? And, the, and I feel like I can only think of, like, five books from the last 20 years, about the last 20 years, so not historic books, by sex workers of color or about the experiences of sex workers of color yes. um, in the United States. So it's another huge absence. Yeah, I, I need to see those stories because those are, you know, I, I met fellow um, immigrant sex workers like myself and it has been life changing. Uh, no offense, I just think they're fascinating, um, way more fascinating than everyone. Just because they're, you know, they're, they're immigrants, um, especially the undocumented ones. Those are the best. Um, those are my people. And, you know, sex workers. It's just that we are just so, we're so cool. Like, we're just so cool. We are the biggest FU to the system that I can come up with. Like, it's phenomenal. And they're so badass, all of them, even the ones that hate their jobs, some of them that are just indifferent, and then those of them that love it just so amazing and I just think that like sex workers in general are like artists and writers in one uh, a lot of times they're like you know Twitter Instagram whatever platform they're on is a form of writing and whatever you write even if it's copy even if it's a fantasy that you're selling there's a part of you that's going to be in there because of your word choices and everything like that so looking at all those things online is so inspirational to me of like look at this goddess creating this like, this mm -hmm. is amazing it's here so you said I it love in Instagram your... stories for that. I feel yes. like people are producing some really ballsy stuff because they're ephemeral. Yes. And you know, I don't know if people are screen capping that stuff, but like, I hope your people who are producing that work keeps it. I found the name of that book. It's called Indecent: yeah. How I Fake It and Make It as a Girl for Hire by yes. Sarah Catherine Lewis, uh, Seal Press, 2006. I don't know if it's in print anymore. Um, it's fantastic. And hold on, Siobhan Brooks's book. Yeah. Siobhan Brooks was a dancer and an organizer at the Lusty Lady in San Francisco. And she wrote a book about the experiences of black strippers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it was published when this came out, so I didn't cite it. Um, but Siobhan, S-I-O-B-A-H-N, Brooks. Lusty Lady was one of the first unions, right? For like that peep show place? It was the only unionized strip club in the United States. Though others were also organizing, um, but there were tremendous union busting campaigns that also followed the Lusty Lady's attempts to unionize. And now the Lusty Lady is no more, so the union is also no more. <sighs> Any other questions, y'all? Oh my god. <laughs> All right. Yay! We'll do rapid fire. <laughs> yes. Rapid fire. Oh, I, I wanted to say something, though. One of my favorite things I found on the internet was a $3,000 um, sex worker who, on her Instagram story, shared that she had a big zit. And I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> She's human. She's not always perfect. Right. You know, but like, it yeah. was, that was a great moment. Just like seeing them be human is like amazing to me. Yeah. Okay, we're going to pass it along. So you were speaking before about the gentrification of sex work and it being pushed out uh, up to the margins and more industrial areas. Uh, when I was living in Montreal for a few years, um, there was an active campaign by the surrounding cities as well to push all of the strip clubs and even massage parlors just right on out of the city uh, and hopefully somewhere by a big highway. Um, and when I spoke out about it in the media, the response from like the nearby city's mayor was, I really don't give a fuck about sex workers. So how do we go past that? Like, how, like I mean, because we can appeal to their humanity, all, to our humanity, all, all we want. Like, we can say, we're people who deserve better. But some people just don't care. And these people are the same ones with the ability to make our lives very dangerous. So how do we go past this not giving a fuck about mm -hmm. us? Yeah. I, I think it's why I keep coming back to Neighbors. And it was like absolutely like chilling to me. Earlier this year, I interviewed uh, Jessica Ramos, a state legislator who's backing full decrim in New York. Um, and the way that she talks about sex work, and particularly sex work in, in Jackson Heights and Queens, where she lives and the district she represents, or part of the district she represents, is like sex workers are my neighbors. So when I'm here fighting, I'm fighting for my neighbors. And I don't, neighbor is like 
kind of a mushy Mr. Rogers word. Not that Mr. Rogers isn't powerful, but like, you know, it, it, but it has this power of just sort of situating people, you know, close to you. That the, Everything you were told is that you have to keep as far away from them as possible and segregate them. And I remember I was in Montreal in 2012, 2012, when the, the kind of the big student protests were also um, mounted. And I went to a funeral for the red light district. The, the, the activists held, including sex workers, and they like actually had like a coffin and red umbrellas and red flowers and a jazz funeral. I mean, it was it was really bizarre to be there at, with all of those things happening at the same time, with like tens of thousands of people out in the streets to support the students um, who were not just like protesting for better conditions at the university, but also because the government cracked down on their rights to protest. Um, and then see people with the same insignia from those protests, the red squares, at the red light district funeral. But there were like less than 100 people at the red light district funeral. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that sense of isolation is like the political power of people who want to push sex workers away. Um, and neighborliness, for some reason, is what I keep going back to. And, um. Maybe it makes a difference that there are some elected officials who are willing to say that now, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanted to add something that's worked for me. Um, yeah, th there's a big part of people that just doesn't care if it harms sex workers because they kind of have an idea that sex workers are greedy B-words and they're hiding the pimps and traffickers or working for them, or they are the pimps and traffickers, but, like, they're greedy, you know, W word like you know so who cares what happens to them we need them off the streets so I just like to shine a light on reality unmask the things that they're talking about so if they're talking about how traffickers and pimps are tricking girls to falling in love with them and that's how they get trafficked I call it what it is it's domestic violence that's what you that's what you mean because otherwise people get confused and they think it's like a shadowy thing that happens and it's like no they're talking about domestic violence the only reason they are saying the word trafficking and pimp and, you know, trick to fall in love and stuff like that is because it involves the sex industry and they just need to make it be scary, right? Or they talk about maybe underage teens that are in the industry, they're trafficked into the industry. Call it what it is. Oh, you mean child labor? Is that what you mean? Because that's what that is. Because um, there are kids that sell sexual services content, that sell drugs, that you know, do underground work. That is something that's happening and they don't call it child labor ever. They call it like forced labor or like trafficking. And it's not, most of these kids are, are doing it because they're forced to by poverty, because they have families to provide for. Maybe they couldn't afford abortion because they had to run away from abusive households um, because they don't want to go to through the orphanage system or go to juvie or go to any of the other options that they have. So like, Reality, like, where are you going to send these kids when you quote unquote save them? What are you going to do about it? You know, I've read your solutions, and your solutions basically say that you don't believe in public housing. You only have like 50 beds for these kids in, in the entire New York City area, um, in the entire state of New York, I'm sorry. And they can only stay there temporarily because you don't believe housing is a universal human right. So you're not going to fix the homelessness problem, and you know, these kids are going to be impacted. Sorry. That was long. No, I mean, in Montreal, that was the thing that struck me is it wasn't an anti-trafficking campaign that was targeting the red light district as I remember it. It was about real estate and kicking out the artists as well and putting in like artists attracting condos that only non-artists could ever afford to live in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to add on to that, um, I mean, that happened in New York too mm -hmm. in like the 70s, like Times Square was a sex worker, um, was, was the place where sex workers went to solicit, and it was a direct effort by uh, politicians to clean the streets. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's the first thing, yeah. But um, the question I had was, I kind of like think a lot about um, how like online erotic services like Craigslist and Back, Backpage and like later on like uh, Tumblr and Twitter kind of like, these were like accidental like harm reduction, mm -hmm. um, technological harm reduction. Um, like no one was making this stuff for sex workers. Sex workers made them um, made them work for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I was just wondering, you know, and, and that's in line with like um, in London, like the introduction of like electric um, electric um, ovens, like reduce suicide rates by a, a ton. The introduction of Craigslist um, 
uh, lowered the female homicide rate by like 17 percent uh, at most. Um, so I was just wondering, like, is there room for um, kind of like a technological harm reduction in the in the face of fossil sesta? Are we like, is it like, are we just going to run into like porn out? Like, are we dealing with the devil? Like, are mm-hmm. is that a bad thing to rely on? I'm really scared that we're moving towards consolidation even more so. I mean, when I was living and working in San Francisco, like the strip clubs were all, this was like in the early 2000s, the strip clubs were all consolidating under the Deja Vu brand. You know, like even places that seemed mom and pop at the end of the day, they were owned by Deja Vu, whether or not that was on the door. Um, you're seeing it in New Orleans right now, even in the French Quarter, right? And on Bourbon Street, the, the strip clubs that are getting raided and shut down are the ones that aren't connected to Hustler and Penthouse to, like, major global brands. Like, this seems to be the, what the, the final, not the final, but, like, the, the, the acceptable sex industry that I'm sure some lawmakers are sitting around saying, well, we'll never get rid of it, but what can we do to make it acceptable? Global brand recognition. And... Um, there's an excellent book about stripping in particular that talks about, I cannot remember the name of this right now, this is terrible, I will tell you before this is over. Um, I reviewed it for The Baffler, and it's about um, how stripping has come to resemble Starbucks, and sort of like draws this connection between service industries that what they're actually selling you is the experience of going there, as much as the product. Mm -hmm. And so like being the kind of guy that goes to like Spearmint Rhino, being the kind of guy who like gets a scotch at the strip club and has a cigar in the cigar lounge versus like the customers I remember who were like long haul truckers (laughs) who were giving you like the 20 bucks they had in their wallet. Um, There was no funny money. There was no like, like blue collar sex work. And so far as any blue collar work exists is like what's getting shrunk by all of these things. Um, so it, if there is harm reduction, that's where it needs to be focused. And it's probably going to be super lo-fi. Uh, it's probably going to be like what's accessible to people who don't have a lot of money to throw at it. Like it's so scary right now that basically Eros is the only game in town for people. And when something goes wrong with Eros, it's like a disturbance in the force. Like I can tell on Twitter, it's like, oh God, like, you know, people's ads aren't up this week. And like, you can see the scramble that comes with that. So, you know, maybe fuck the high end. You know, like, fuck that. Like, maybe there needs to actually be, like, a more broadening of, like, for lack of a better term, working in middle-class sex work and creating tools for that. Um, But it's going to come from sex workers' own ingenuity, the way that it always has. So I'm willing to be surprised, but I'm kind of a tech nihilist right now. Yeah. Sorry. questions? Yeah. Um, So you were talking about red light districts and how they've been pushed out. Are there any existing red light districts left in the United States? Like, Ooh. You know? um, Not legally sanctioned ones. Okay. Um, I mean, there was a time in the 70s, around the time of Times Square, where, and because obscenity laws were rolling back, like, cities, like, officially engaged in red light district experiments. Detroit had one. Okay. Boston had one, which I find fascinating. Um, and then, like, those places got gentrified out. Like, in Boston, it was sort of the desire to gentrify Chinatown and put in, like, a new medical center. That's essentially what killed the red light district there. And also a murder. It's usually, like, in the closure of a red light district, like, some high-profile violence that they then try to peg to it. Um, so, I, I mean, I think of that neighborhood in San Francisco where the strip clubs are, North Beach, as sort of, like, like a red light district in that it is legalized work. And so it's sort of, like, a legally permitted space. But I don't think there's anything, Bourbon Street, it's the legal industry. It's like what is left of the legal strip club industry that's not pushed out into the industrial zones. Um, Yeah, I have one written down. Any other questions? Oh, we got it. So I have one right now. Oh. Um, Like, what are the material conditions um, that cause people to choose, um, I would say, criminalized sex work rather than uh, doing it online or doing it in, doing legalized or uh, not criminalized sex work? I mean, the first one I can think of, and I'm going to toss it to you, is if you aren't legally permitted to work, then how are you going to work in the legal sex industry? Yeah. um, I've been on and off in the sex industry in various parts, and 
really what made me go full time was like when Donald Trump was elected because he was going to get rid of DACA and that's my work authorization. So I needed to create an underground safety net in case I lost my right to work. And that was like the industry I felt safest in. I know I don't particularly like drugs. I'm not going to sell that and I'm not going to work in the underground industries because I've seen my father do that. He's worked the fields for $5 an hour. He's worked really exploitative jobs. So has my mother. Um, a lot of these retail companies you get your clothes at, they hire undocumented immigrant labor in some way, shape, or form, either um, uh, to clean up their places, and they, they do this illegally, but, you know, it doesn't matter because, you know, you have managers and people who have to meet certain quotas and certain requirements, and the only way to really hit that is to break the law somehow. And the heads know this. They purposely make the goals bigger like that. So I know how exploitative all industries are. Um, no one really cares about labor trafficking, and that's kind of the issue because they, they split up sex and, and labor. So sex is not considered labor, and that's the only thing they care about, and labor just kind of gets ignored. So I decided to go full-time in the industry so I would have like a way to survive if the worst happens, which it kind of is. So. You know, even like with my parents, my parents have TPS for Honduras, they might lose that, so how am I going to make enough money to support my whole entire family, right? Because I have little sisters, I have parents, I have, like, you know, this community that I have to protect. Um, All those underground industries, too, are, are interconnected, you know? Like, I'm thinking of some of the stories I'm hearing out of, of Queens and the kind of nascent massage business organizing. Yes. And, uh, and, was... and hearing about how, you know, there are women who will work in a nail salon, or work in a, a massage business or work doing kind of like underground child care, like and underground nanny services or child care facilities. And just the flow between all of those is a lot more than we might think of. Um, they're cash based, cash on the day that you work, don't necessarily need, you know, official documentation to work. Um, and as long as there isn't something else that meets all those qualifications, like those are the jobs that there are. Yes. Um, there's also the fact that like, Working legally is, is tricky, and it's a very white-dominated world no matter where you go. Uh, you can go to the brothels in Nevada, um, very white if you look at the lineup. Um, they take like 50% of your profit. You have to apply and be picked to work there. It's temporary, uh, temporary so you work like two weeks, maybe three months at most if they like you. Um, and again, 50% of your profit is taken away. That's a legal structure. Um, and you have to meet all these requirements. They have to think you're pretty enough to sell. And all the brothels are owned by one person, so anyone working outside of that is doing it illegally. So most people are working illegally. They, they have to. You know, a lot of people work under the table as well. So it's the same reasons why most people would work under the table. Mm -hmm. It's the reason why people are working in the sex industry under the table. I think that's all the time we have for questions. Mm -hmm. Melissa, is there anything else you want to talk about as we're wrapping up? I would just say since we are in New York, and this is sort of unfolding right now, um, over the next couple of weeks as the legislative session is still open in Albany, keep an eye on the work that Decrim New York is doing, uh, introducing legislation not only to repeal the loitering bill, uh, loitering laws in New York that target sex workers, to make it easier for sex workers and survivors of trafficking to get their criminal records sealed, um, but other kinds of laws that target people in the sex trades. Um, that is amazing to me. That is something I did not imagine I would be living through when I wrote this five years ago. I am, like, completely humbled by the fact that I'm wrong all of the time. I need to become more optimistic, but I do like to keep my expectations low so I'm constantly impressed um, when these good things happen. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just, like, completely stunned that that's the New York that we're all sitting in right now, that this could actually happen. Thank you again for coming out and um, just sort of wrapping up because we have to close right now. Um, this is just a little intro about our, our book club. Sorry, we're like very nervous this very first time that we're <laughs> nervous. putting doing this great. together. It's I'm really tech. appreciative yeah, of Melissa for coming out. Um, in the next um, monthly book club series, we're going to be reading Revolting Prostitutes next and doing like a web-based <coughs> um, interview. And then we'll also have Chia Donna. We're going to be reading um, Andrea Ritchie's book. So um, we hope that you all follow us on social media um, and engage. You can send your questions to us, like, and we'll ask the questions to whoever's um, presenting the book. Um, our Instagram account is redlight.reader, and our Twitter account is redlightreader. 
And, um, and our website is redlightreader.org. Yeah. And We've got all the things. <laughs> as you yes. read the books, if you find passages that you like, we're really asking people to share. Like, just take a picture, put it up, and we really want people to just, like, proliferate sex worker writing on the internet and hope that you'll participate in that as we go forward. So, yeah, thank you again so much for coming out. Thank you, guys.